man. Thank you for being us. And 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 Tracy, we always ask this question right out at the get go of our shows. Have you seen the movie Hoop Dreams? Absolutely. Who hasn't? <laughs> Who hasn't? You know what I'm saying? We grew up on that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was I was probably slightly I might have been slightly ahead of you guys, but I'm still watching your journey. You know, and, and, and your journey is everybody's journey. We all gone through what you guys are going through. Being the best in our area, trying to be the best in the state, trying to be the best in America. Injuries pop up, threatens our career. You know, we've all had that situation. We all come from something and we're trying to get it. And trying, you know to escape, and trying to escape them potholes from the hood. That a got absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Big pothole. Yes. Yes. I no mean, shoot, we, you know, I mean, I, I may not have grown up in Watts, but, you know, we had some elements in Pasadena, too, where I grew up. Yeah. So, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, we all grew up around the same stuff, man. And, and, and we all had to stick to the same script just to get out. Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. The man joining us today, I mean, the, the, the accomplishments are like off the chain, off the wall. So I'm just going to give people a few of the many, many, many accomplishments that our next guest has. He's a McDonald's All-American at Glendora High School in California where he averaged, get this, A.G., not 20 points a game, <laughs> not 30 points a game, what? but 44 points a game in his senior year. Come on, man, that's that's off the chart. Damn. Y'all heard that right, 44 points a game. He was a two-time All-Pac-10 player of the year with the UCLA Bruins. Selected in the first round of the 1992 NBA draft, going out 18th overall. Get this, AG. He played one year, two years, three years. He put some work in the league, 12 years in the NBA, and won an NBA championship with the 1995 Houston Rockets. We like to welcome to the Hoop Dreams podcast the one, the only, Mr. Tracy Murray. I'm Will Gates, and that's my dog. I love you guys, man. You you guys, hey, we all we all grew up in this thing together, man. It's a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. You know, obviously we call this the Hoop Dreams Podcast, but truthfully, today it's the Tracy Murray Podcast because man, <laughs> we, we want to know about you, man, your origin story. So take us back to your neighborhood, 70s, the 80s. What was it like growing up Tracy Murray? Well, growing up in Pasadena, man, it's... Um, I grew up in Michael Cooper's basketball camps. I grew up in the boys and girls clubs. I grew up in the YMCA's. You know, we all grew up hooping, playing pool, ping pong, all the same stuff we all, you know, did as kids, man. And and of course, you know, it's no different than Chicago, man. You know, it's in New York and anywhere else. You know, this this little gang gang element. You know, what I mean, drug dealing and all of that stuff that that's that's around. Yeah. But you know, it, it's like. It's funny how how there's a rule, an unwritten rule. Like when when young fellas are trying to do something, it's kind of like the hands off of them. They're mm -hmm. trying to do something else. Yeah. So yeah. that that's the past. I had that past in Pasadena where I grew up, man, because I grew up, you know, where the Bloods were, and I moved up to where the Crips were. So, and I went to junior high school with both. So. You know, I mean, the elements were always there, but if you look in Little Pasadena and you look at all the talent that came out of there, you talking, you know, Ryan Holland, Stacy Augman, um, you talking uh, Troop, the group Troop, John B. Um, you know, I'm, there's tons of baseball players, Ricky Urbans who played with the Washington Redskins, mm -hmm. um, um, Marcus Robertson, who's who's long time. Uh, NFL player. Now he's a coach with the uh, uh, Arizona Cardinals, Tony Crutchfield. I mean, I, the list goes on. And then you look at the street ball players. You know, you got you got sick with it. You got Bone Collector. Yep. 
I mean, you mm-hmm. got you got dudes that that that's come through, that grew up there. You know what I'm saying? And it, it's 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 a it's a bunch of us that I'm you know just just right off the top of my head. I'm not there right now, but tons of us, man. There's tons of talent in Pasadena, and we all found our way out some way. My my yeah. uncle is 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 uh. James McAllister, God rest his soul. That's Chris McAllister who played in the NFL. Yes. That's my cousin. So wow. there's, t- I mean, my brother played, you know. So, I mean, Le- LeBron Murray, my first cousin. Yeah. He grew up in yeah. Pasadena, his childhood, before he moved up to the Bay. So there's a lot of talent that that's come out of Pasadena. Mm. Mm. Man, so mm. I'm, I'm wondering, man, because you know, in, in hoop dreams, we showed that playground aspect. Did 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 yep. you and your brothers grow grow up playing outdoors first? Oh, absolutely. You know, recess, lunchtime. It's on the blacktop. You know, we all grew up playing on the blacktop at some point. You know what I mean? And then um, when it came to like games and organized stuff, like the boys and girls club, YMCA, it well. Palm Street YMC, we were on, we were outside of the blacktop, but like there are some that had gyms. So we went in the gyms and, and then we played at Washington Junior High School. Uh, uh, we played at Victory Park, Villa Park, Jackie Robinson Center. So there's, there are tons of places where we grew up hooping. Mm. Now, you know what I want to get into is, because uh, you've seen it in the movie, yep. I'm going against my brother. AG going against his dad. <laughs> what was them battles like with you and Cameron, man, coming up as kids? You know what, man? Um, I say this a lot and people think I'm bullshitting, excuse my language, but my brother was better than I was. It's just the size difference is what kept him away. You know what, what? I mean? His Yeah, Cam was better than me, man. Cam well, shoot. Cam was a state player of the year as a sophomore. Wow. Damn. He was co state player of the year with Charles O'Bannon. As a sophomore, really? What? Yep, yep. His team was thirty-three and one. <sighs> wow! They beat Don't... Charles O'Bannon and them in the sectionals, CIF sectionals, and then lost to him in state. Wow! <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So I, I mean, Cam was a killer, man. It's just he went to the wrong college, like right out the gate. He was supposed to go to UCLA, but things with me on the way out because of leaving early. Mm-hmm. It wasn't too, it wasn't cool for him. You know what I mean? It was a, they were a little upset at me, so he didn't want to go there and, and get screwed. So he ended up going to USC because George Raveling was putting guards in the league. Mm-hmm. He had put Robert Pack in the league. He had put Dwayne Cooper in the league. He had put Harold Miner in the league. So he was like, well, shoot, I'm sliding over here. Maybe something good can happen. And then George Raveling got in that car accident. Mm. That ended his career, and my brother never played for George Rapp. So there were two years that he was stuck at USC. Wow. And then he so, had to figure so that thing out. And I don't know anybody that can uh, transfer up and succeed. Like, he went from USC, which is a football school, to Louisville. Wow. And and ended up starting over there and finishing his career with it there. So Cam was a killer, man. He, he just – I thought he – he was extremely talented, and he also um, he didn't have the size that that he should have had, but he also uh, developed even more late because he took it more serious. You know how you're young, you like hanging out with your friends and getting a little bit, you know, mischief a little bit, mm-hmm. wasn't like a hundred percent focus. Yeah, that's what happened to him. Yeah. What's the What's the age gap between you two? Four years. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean he ended up he ended up um in the CBA. He had a he had a tryout with the Raptors and he had a tryout with the Indiana Pacers. Mm-hmm. So I mean he he has he had a couple of shots, you know, and then he ended up doing the Globe Trotter thing. And then, mm-hmm. you know, he's like, All right, I'm tired of chasing. Let me go ahead and train these kids and and, and develop a an AAU program. That's beautiful. What's what's That's the name of his up. program? Prodigy Athletic. Prodigy Athletics, love it. Yeah, so it's been it's he's been in uh over twenty years, man, of training kids and and having an AAU program. We know about Mac Irvin Fire. We know about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mac know about us. Absolutely. See, we're not sure we're do. not we're not sponsored. You know what I mean? But there's a mutual respect between us and Mac because 
like I, like Mac used to come to UCLA and play pickup games with Byron when, up there with us mm-hmm. at UCLA. So yeah. I've been knowing Mac a long time. And then, you know, I know he can shoot that rock. You know what I mean? He can shoot yeah. that thing. Yeah, he can. Shoot yeah. that thing. So, so, yeah. so, 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 I mean, it was natural for, and he's extremely competitive just like his brother. So it was natural when we finally like hooked up and played against each other that it was going to be extremely competitive. That back gym in Las yeah. Vegas was on fire. Mm. Mm. I can only imagine, man. I can yeah. only imagine. We had mm-hmm. a young Kessler Edwards on that team that he that he was coaching against. Really? Really? Yeah, yeah. Yo, it's yeah. another AAU squad out there with uh uh what's the boy name? The Compton Magic. Yeah, Compton Magic. Yeah, they know they know about us too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but see, they sp- they sponsored, man. So, you know, they try sp- sponsored teams. That's what I like about Mac Urban. Mm-hmm. They're a sponsored team, but they want to the smoke. That's right. They, they There's a lot of sponsored nobody. teams. Nah, nah, them, Seattle Rotary, you know, they they want to the smoke. They don't care who it is. And no, there I are also some. Give, um, Mac Irvin them this too, man. They, 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 they stay home and play a lot of the local teams too. Yeah, man. yeah. That's, yeah. that's huge, I mean, man. You not only not only are are you doing it for yourself and your kids to get more rest, but you also giving other kids an opportunity to be seen. That's yeah. right. You know That's what I'm right. saying? Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Mac Irvin, for giving us a chance to be seen. Because yeah. the Compton Magics of the world or, or some of these other guys, they want to keep their their shoe they, they want to keep their shoe situation so they don't want to see us. That's right. That's mm. what they, so, they like. So, they like we can't get beat by the prodigy. They they, they, they right. They don't get, even have a shoe company. You know what I mean? It's like we can't get beat by them. So the right. shoe, so I mean, does the shoe companies tell them where they can play and where they can't? I don't I don't know exactly how it happens. I just know there's sometimes we are in the same bracket, and then before, when the, when we finally start going, they're not mm-hmm. in our bracket anymore. Yep. So I don't know how that happens. I'm not saying they're ducking this. But I'm saying something is going on. You know what I mean? It might be the shoe company. And a lot of times, right, I'm going to say it's the shoe company, but a lot of times, too, they when you go to those different tournaments, they have, and you've seen this a lot, Tracy, them super pools. And they're only letting 12 of those in there. And it's the same 12. And and we on the outside looking in. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Wanting to smoke. You know, hey, hey, let us get our ass kicked. We we want to smoke. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And speaking of that, getting it kicked. (laughs) <laughs> Who was that cat in your neighborhood that you said, when I beat this dude, I know I'm mm. ready? Who was that guy for you? There were, I played in a lot of adult leagues with my dad. Um, you know, he always he always took me around to play pickup in adult leagues and stuff like that. Um, wow. that's a, I'm going to say it like this. It probably wasn't an individual. Mm. Mm. But I was on ARC team number two, Mid Valley ARC team number two. Okay. Team number one was the M squad: Derek Martin, Don McLean, Chris Mills, Doug Meekins, and James Moses. Ooh! And they went out and recruited and got Sean Kemp, Chris Lawson, and Sean Woods. <laughs> so they loaded up, right? Yes. And we beat them. That's when really? I knew we arrived. Yeah. Really? What? Yeah, we beat them. It was me, Mitchell Butler, Adonis Jordan, Wayne Womack. You know, we we had we had a few too. Idris Jones, we had a few too. Man, but that's they my name. I ain't heard in a minute. Mitchell Butler. Oh, he was that was a- my college roommate. Was he? Yeah, Mitch was my roommate. Man, he was a baller, man. <laughs> oh Mitch God. is an agent now. He played nine years in the league. He's an agent now. Really? Yep. When well, he went undrafted, worked his way in, and was and and, and held on for a while. No man, I, when you decide to be on the show, I, I I always ask guests this, and I want to get get this from you too, man. Who who put the ball in your hand? My dad. I mean, and, and the interesting story was, you know, he he's a gym rat, always have been, always will be, still a gym rat at seventy five years old. So so he he can sit in gyms all day, watch people play, and all that. So when he was hooping. You know, it'd be him and my uncles and, and, and a bunch of dudes in the neighborhood hooping. I was a baby, and he would bring me, and I would be crying like a mug in the corner. I wouldn't shut up. He brought a basketball and put it right there. That's all it took. 
not a bottle, not a pacifier, a basketball. So you was you was born for that. Yeah, he knew right then. Oh, I might have some. My goodness. <laughs> you know, man, it's 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 funny because I got a very similar story, man. I I remember my brother, I was probably about five and you know, he, he probably was forced to babysit me. But he'd take <laughs> me to the playground. And you know, you, you just want to play and they and they wouldn't let you play. But he did the same thing, man. He set a ball in front of me and was like, listen, when my game is over, I'm going to take you out here and get you a couple of shots. Now, it seemed like he played mm-hmm. like a million games, but right. yeah, I, I, I remember that so vividly. But I want to move into your high school, man. And, and typically, you being recruited at Glendora High School. But talk to us about high school and how was it for you? Because, I mean, you walked in. What? How, how tall was you when you your freshman year? Well... I, um, it's an interesting story. My my freshman year, the summer of my freshman year, I grew from five eleven to six four oh in three God. months. But my what? body went out of whack. Yeah, my body went out of whack. So I had a major hip surgery on my left hip, and they told me I'll never play again. But you guys know how that is, man. You know everybody done been through injuries here, and and, and you're not gonna let somebody tell you that you're done. You know what I'm saying? So I sat out my whole freshman year. I I made varsity with a severe limp, and then I couldn't play. I was on crutches for the rest of the year. Damn. So um, I came back my sophomore year at 6'5", and then, you know, put in a little bit of work, you know, average 28, and then my junior year I was 6'7", and then average 31, and my senior year I stayed at 6'7". And, and you know the 44. Hey, AJ, you see how he just slid that in there? You see how he slid that in there? I put in a little bit of work. <laughs> I was California's bit. all-time leading scorer in three years. What? Yeah. What? The whole state? The whole state. I was number one in three years. Cam was number two. What? Cam was number two. Y'all just can't play in the family. <laughs> Dog, what type well, you of? Had, and, and then you had, then you had two in the same high school at number two for a while, and then Casey Jacobson, who who was younger than all of us, came and broke all the records later. And then you, at one time, you had all Glendora cats at one, two, and three. Dog, our coach you knew that? how to put us in position to score, to to do our thing. But the growth part was you having growing pains. Like what the hell? Oh, like, man, and you man, didn't even I, play. Like, man, I I was. I slept a lot that summer, but I, I, when I was playing, I was starting to play with a severe limp. I thought it was a pull growing. I ain't never had a pull growing before. So, right. But but it, the limp was starting to be so bad that my dad's like, yo, it ain't no pull growing. We got to find out what the hell this is. Mm. So we went to five, you know, well-renowned doctors that looked at it and it was like, you're done. Wow. You know, I, we can't even touch you. Really? But then, yeah, but then, and this is all around the country. But then we found somebody right in our backyard at Orthopedic Hospital, Dr. Stanford Noel. He saved my career. He saved my life. Uh, gave me a second opportunity, man. He went in there. He put eight screws in place. Mm-hmm. Cut the back, cut the bad part of the bone was curving. So he cut the bad part out, put the eight screws together, let the bone men back together. That's what happened that, that year I was out. The bone was mending back together. My left side's a little bit shorter than my right side. But I had to I had to figure it out. You know what I mean? I had to figure it out. But none of the doctors said, like, you you know you're still growing, right? Like, did they did they even mention that? No. I, I probably would have been 6'9 if my hip wasn't messed up. Give me 6'9, I'm an NBA All-Star. Easy. <laughs> Easy. Easy. But I'm just saying, but still to just think about your career, man, everything that you've gone through, because a lot of times I think as athletes, we 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 know other athletes are dealing with what we go through. But when you hear the stories, they're so unique and so different, man, because I didn't I didn't know this aspect about your story, you know, uh, you know, with, with your hip and, and your career almost not even happening, man. So, man. Thank God, man, that, you know, that doctor, that one doctor. <laughs> that one doctor that knew what he was doing. My goodness, yep. man. That's why That's why with Hoop Dreams, I felt what you were going through, Will, 
and I also been what you went through, AG. Is because mm-hmm. it's, it's like it's like you know when, when all of this is going on, and your mind is messed up, then your academics drop. You know what I'm saying? And I was almost academically ineligible for my my sophomore year because I was distracted. You know, mm-hmm. my yeah. injury, feeling sorry for myself. Uh, you know, all of that stuff, man. So yeah. I, I had to get it together, man. So, you know, because UCLA, UCLA is not an easy place to get into. They made me jump through hoops to get in there. But, but you know, I no, know that seriously, story. Yeah, seriously, I know that even, story. Even, even though, even though, you know, I was California State Player of the Year, they made me do all kinds of other stuff, man, because I didn't have the highest SAT score. And, you know, I didn't have the highest GPA. And they're like, okay, they're, they, they do take a chance on some guy. Mm. If I if I wasn't California State Player of the Year, they probably would just swept me by the wayside and be like, "Now nah, go somewhere else." Wow. Yeah, I had some people in that school that were pulling for me. Yeah. So so this is how the recruiting went down. Everything worked itself out. That's so crazy, right? So, New Mexico, UNLV, Villanova, UCLA, and Louisville. Mm. So. Villanova was if I, because it was fashionable to go to the Big East at that time, you know, if you were a top West Coast guy, because you wanted your respect on the East. I didn't. I said, if I went to, to the East, I would have went with Roly Massimino. I mean, he came in the house and really impressed our family. Mm. Uh, um, well, New Mexico was a long shot. I went. To, I, I put New Mexico on there, like if I wanted to go there and fuck and just like tear the house down. Luke Longley was the center, so he was mm. already drawing a lot of NBA attention. He was like the number one center in the country that year. So that that was an option. Uh, Louisville, what happened there, a lot of people don't know, Allen Houston's my cousin too. So, really? so what, Yeah, so he had already signed there. His dad was the assistant coach. His dad got the head coaching job at Tennessee, and he went with his dad. So that kind of that wiped Louisville out, right? So it was down to UCLA and UNLV. Oof. And and my dad played for Jerry Tarkanian. So I was like really, really close to going to UNLV. It, what stopped me from going to UNLV was I'm hearing that they're about to go on probation because of the picture with the mobster in the hot tub. So it was like, mm-hmm. you know, I, it was a, there was there was probation coming. So I was like, uh, I can't do that. And then I ended up right there. UCLA, it worked out. I mean, you had, you were on the great teams at US, UCLA, but could oh, yeah. you imagine if you would have went to UNLV playing I with been on that ninety one yes. uh, uh, championship? Larry team. Yeah. Johnson, yeah. Stacy Augman, Anderson Hunt. I mean, and I and I was cool with all of them. You oh, know, I grew up goodness. with I grew up with Stace. When I was on my visit, I got cool with all of them. I'm still talking to Moses Curry and them to this day. Man. Mm. Damn. Man, y'all would have been the most, I mean, they were already a dominant team, but y'all would have just been yeah. unbeatable yeah. that year. Yeah. That's insane. I heard, I heard there were more coming. You know, if that didn't happen, there were more coming. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It, it was about to be a dynasty in the desert. In, in high school, I went to their team camps. They used Did to have you? team camps yeah. where, where high schools would come into there and then, then you would do their drills and, and go through their system, and they'll see you practice and stuff like that. Yeah, in high school, because my high school coach was best friends with Mark Workington. God rest his soul, he just passed away. Mark Workington recruited me. He was one of the assistant coaches for UNLV, and we, which get, which had the the relationship, you know, that I had with Coach Tark because of my dad and Coach Gerd, you know, as, as, you know his relationship with us through the camps and everything. I uh, got close with Coach Starr, who golfs with my dad to this day. So I was in with the coaching staff, man. So that thing, all, it was really close to happen. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you went to UCLA because your legacy is there. But, man, I would have loved to see you play with them dudes yeah. there, man. That would have been a trip. The way we were getting up and down the, they were getting up and down the floor. Yes. I mean, yes. I, was look, I was looking at what Dave Rice and, and Travis Bice was getting the shots that they were getting, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, those are my shots right there. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. yes. Trace, yes. you know what I always loved about your game was that you could shoot it off the dribble, off the one-two dribble, or catch and shoot. Yeah, you know what's so crazy is 
you had to have an escape dribble. Once once everybody knew you can shoot, they're not going to let you just catch and shoot. So you got to be able to rip through. You got ball fake, you know, escape dribble right or left. You got to be able to do both. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, put a debate on who's the greatest shooter ever. I, I'm, I'm saying Steph, man. The reason why I'm saying Steph is because, like, me, Larry Bird, his dad, Glenn Rice, all of these dudes, Dennis Scott, everybody can shoot the ball on the catch-and-shoot basis. Yep. Same with Steph. But when you start getting downhill and coming off of picks and pushing it up the floor and you're pulling up from, like, 35, yes. it's like, come on, man. He took that to another whole level, man. And then Dame Lillard is right behind him doing yes. the same thing. Yeah, you got to give Dame time his credit, man. Absolutely. It's like these two dudes took shooting to another atmosphere. No disrespect to Ray Allen because Ray Allen did what I did. You know what I mean? Yeah. But and Reggie Miller and all these guys, we all did it in a different way. We did it with catch and shoot and escape dribbles. These guys, are, you know what I mean? It's like it's different. It's, they're different. But the game they're was different. taught differently too, though. I mean, when, when we all were coming up, we was we were taught one or two dribble pull up you know yeah. we wasn't we wasn't taught to have that freedom because nah. my thing is this you know if it like like i remember you in summer leagues and playing and stuff and i i used to say man i know tracy can go to the cup and dunk on cats like you you know you yeah. didn't see a lot of that during yeah. your college days but then right. when i'm seeing you out there on the playground i'm like okay here i hear because when you was a shooter you was defined Kind of like right. to that to position. put you in the box. Yes. To put you in the box. Yeah. You can't average 44 a game just shooting three. You know what I'm saying? You, you just can't. They're going to take that away. I was able to post up. I was dunking. I was off I was a really good offensive rebounder. You know, it's like the reason how I learned how to offensive rebound is because when I first got on the travel ball team or AAU team, they wouldn't pass me the ball. Mm -hmm. So my pops was like, what are you crying for? Go get it off. Get, get your big ass on the glass. So I learned how to go to the glass. So, you know, everything that I learned, you know, it, it, it helped me for for the future mm -hmm. when it comes to playing basketball. It, it helped me score in many different ways. I could, you just couldn't put me in a box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you shot and you shot out when you 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 was always ready. Like with your hands to catch and shoot, but you shot off your toes, off the ball yep. of your foot. That's yep. how. That's how. I, that's how you shot. And I always tell players. I said, "Bro, I don't care how you hold the ball, how you shoot it, and all that. When you get up here, I was like, if your feet is not right, mm -hmm. it, it it will it will show in the shot. Your feet is the most important thing. Your feet got to be ready. If your feet ain't ready, your shot is off." Yep. Your 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 guy foot got to be pointed towards the basket, just like your elbow got to be pointed towards the basket, and your feet you got to have your knees bent when you're catching that thing and be ready to let it go. And that's why you that's why you said it makes Dame and Steph then took it to another level because now they making six and eight dribbles to get to to get create space and they From still 35. and they. And they feet still be up under rim and everything follow through. I'm talking about it's cash money. From 35. Like, we would catch and shoot from 28. From 20, right. <laughs> but they doing all of this and pulling up from 35. I mean, yeah. they just took that thing to another whole level. AJ and I, man, we got this thing we want to do with you. It's called halftime. Yeah. And what we're going to do is, man, we're going to throw some quick hitters at you. Okay. And we want to we want to see what 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 you're gonna throw back at us. So I'm gonna okay. hit you with this first one. Give me three players you play with or against that you thought should have made the league. There's a guy that a lot of people don't know. His name is Reggie Cott. He's about six three, six four from Pasadena. Jump out the gym, strong, shoot. He he played shoot it way out like off the dribble, step back from like 35. And he was our age, so he was before his time. You know what I'm saying? He he just didn't like school. Gotcha. Mm. You know, he didn't like school. Him, um, man, Conrad McCray was a beast. Conrad McCray was, you know, God rest his soul. That was my man. 
and, and, and he was athletic, blocked shots, ran the floor like a deer. There's a guy that, that's out of your area, Ronnie Fields. Yeah. Ronnie Fields. He was for real. Yeah. You know, of course, my, of course, I'm going to, people going to think I'm biased when I say my brother, but I've seen my brother destroy dudes in the league in summer league. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I've seen it with my own eyes. I'm not just saying it, you know, so of course I, I'll say my brother, you know. Uh, your most memorable high school game and why? It's the one that we lost. It's the losses always kill you. The losses, you always replay the losses in your mind. The losses, you always look at like, what could I have done better to win? Mm. I had 64 points, 19 rebounds, seven block shots, five assists, three steals, and we lost by six. This a real Man. high school game? <laughs> State championship game. Hey, hey this, this, this is what my mind thinking right now. You know how you guys talk about going down the state? We we're going up the state. And we lost in the state championship game. And you had how many points again? 64. So this, that's what I'm thinking, A.G. You know, high school basketball ain't number 32 minutes. Right! <laughs> he got up 64 points <laughs> in a half an hour. <laughs> what, was well, know, what was the name of that team? I know you remember. Menlo Atherton. I'll never forget it. 89-83. Who the hell did they have? They had a team that was there the year before and lost. So they were, I'll be damned, you know, they're, they're going to be like, I'll be damned we're going to let somebody beat us when we were here last year. You know what I mean? They had two twins, Kendrick and Cedric Reed. They were both 6'3". They had a 6'5 athlete named Atiba Williams. Then they had another 6'7 white dude, and then they had a dude that was about 6'5", about 250, and he was a, a future Dallas Cowboy. Wow. So you had that. And then you had like a solid dude coming off the bench. Now, my help got hurt in the first quarter. My help went to Illinois, and he was a quarterback for Illinois. And he never reached his potential because he hurt his back in our game. He was a no, he was, he was, he should have been in the NFL. J.J. Olafson. J.J. Olafson should have been in the yeah. NFL. He, he, was, yeah. he was the quarterback for Illinois. That was my high school teammate. He fell on his back and got low bridge in the first quarter of the game, and he wasn't the same after that. He gutted yeah. it out, but he wasn't the same. That is insane. Like, the game before, I was struggling against Dominguez, and he was carrying us until I caught fire. Like, he, he was tough. He scored 64 points. And you was off in the first quarter? <laughs> no, no, this is no, 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 no. The, that game, I slowed down in the in the second and third quarter. I had twenty two in the first and twenty two in the fourth. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> did you hear them numbers? It's twenty two uh, and twenty a quarter. I but, but when you when you look around and you see that okay, no one on my team has been on this level, right? You see the fear in people's eyes. Mm. And you're like, damn it, I got to do this by myself. Yeah. But I knew I had JJ, but when he got hurt, I really looked around. I was like, it's all me now. I got to do it. I, I got to go by myself until, I, you know, everybody else is scared. You know, it, I know we're doing our halftime, man, but I just got to ask you this. In moments like that, I think secretively mm -hmm. in the athlete's head, we cherish those moments, though. Absolutely. Like, I think we love that. Like, we love that it's all on us. Not to be selfish, but that's the pressure you want. Yes. That's how you, that's how you prove your greatness. Yes. Right? You yes. look for those moments to, to say, world, here is whoever it is. Right? Yes. So, I mean, everybody's had that moment, man. Everybody's had that moment where, where they had to, like, all right, strap it on, guys. Get in this That's backpack right. and let's go. It's all on you. I remember, yeah. I remember one game, man, we were playing, and I was sick. And it was mm -hmm. like halftime. And Coach Payne came to me and said, you just going to let us lose? Right. Because <laughs> I, I hadn't even played the first two quarters. Mm -hmm. And he was like halftime, so you just going to let us lose? Great coaches always challenge you. Yes. Yes. Forever changed my game too, man. So would you get? Would you come out and get? I have forty. I have Woo! forty. 
Ooh. our 42 quarters. <laughs> and we won. <laughs> Hey, hey, you know what happens when you, 42 quarters. You know when you have a great coach, what they do is, man, they'll never give you no prof. They'll be like, yeah, I want to thank William for fighting through that. You know, there's something there we can is. learn from it. They'll never let you get a big head, right? They keep you right, right where right. you at. Because, because you're already getting enough of these, right? Yeah. From people in the stands, you're getting enough of these. Coach going to make sure he reel you in. Yep, yep. Your I coach that, and your man. parents. Your coach, your parents, your brothers, or whatever, anybody close to you, they're going to make sure that, that you stay grounded because everybody around you telling you you're great. Your inner circle got to keep it 1,000 with you. Absolutely. And rest in peace, Coach Payne. Uh, yeah. What other passions do you have outside of basketball that if you were not an NBA star, what would you have been doing? Well, I was messing around with the music a little bit. Uh, and, and, I, and I found that passion. I always loved music. Uh, I was in a drum class when I was young, uh, trumpet, trombone. So I had a little bit, you know, of music classes in the in the past. But in the league, man, when when you know sometimes you know things just don't go well. You either you're gonna be sitting in those four walls thinking about the game all the time, mm. and that's what causes slumps. Mm. You stop believing in yourself because you're thinking about the last one. You're thinking about the last one when there's more to come. Right. And you need an outlet. So I went and bought a studio, man, and just started making beats. Really? So that's what I that's what that's what my outlet was. And I used to be in the studios with with, with, with some some talent, you know, Neo and Six John and a lot of dudes. I, I was just sitting up in there, just soaking up the game, watching them do their thing. You know, so, yeah, man, I, I, you know, music probably would have would have been I would have dove all the way in if it wasn't for who. So, we, so is is there still a TM Productions out there somewhere? Nah, man. You know, I, I was, you know what? It, it, it's like it's like I I never sold a beat. I was doing it for my mind. I was doing it as an outlet. Um, started getting pretty good at it, but I never like actively pursued it. Gotcha, gotcha. But I knew people if I wanted to actively pursue it to just jump right in, you know what I mean? Because they're always looking for dudes that's going to help out production-wise. They can't do it all by themselves. They're always looking for a camp. So I could have slid into a camp. Hey, Tracy, this is another one. I quick hitter for you. Your favorite overseas cities that you played in and that, mm. you, live, and that you live in? Athens, for sure. I played in Athens, man. I played for Panathinaikos over there. And Athens is off the chain. Really? Um, the Saloniki's nice, too, because I played my second year at the Saloniki. Um, Moscow wasn't bad. I played over there. Moscow wasn't bad, man. You know, all, all the you know there was some cool people over there. The city was cool. It, it wasn't bad. Um, Turkey was kind of cool. Istanbul. Um, there was a couple, man. There was a couple. There was a couple that was all right. It's funny, your first choice, everybody we talk to says the same thing. That, <laughs> that's the city that they, Athens, they have to live yeah, there. Man. They could live there. Well, well, Mike Batiste is from Long Beach, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and he grew up playing against Cam, playing with and against Cam. And I ended up being his teammate in 04. You know, and, 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 and honestly, he should have been in the league. You know, he was the last cut of the Clippers and he had 30 on the Lakers, and I was on the Lakers at the time. He had 33 on us and got cut the next day. What? That's what it is, man. What? That's what it is. He had 33 on us and got cut the next day. <laughs> what? It's so, like... so you know, he he went over there and started establishing himself. And by the time I got there, man, he he was like all in. You know, he he he's one of the one of the top players to ever play in Europe now. Now he's over here coaching in the league. Mm. Well, I got to hit you with this, Tracy. Says you're a music guy. Nah. Got to give me your top five rappers of all time. Top five rappers. Mm. Of all time. Your top five. It's, to me, it's not, it's not that hard. I think it's, you know, in, in any order. It can go in any order, man. You know, you got Biggie, Pop. Jay Z, Nas, that fifth spot. Mm. Kendrick, really? 
No, 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 no. Eminem, no. Eminem, 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 no, Eminem. No love for the ninety guys. Eminem. No, no Eric B. No Rakim. No LL. I I love them. I love them. I love them. But those those dudes took it to another whole level. Like no Big the best Daddy one. Kane. I hey Kane is my man too. They used to call me Big Daddy Trey. You know what Kane? <laughs> Hey, Kane might be Kane might Kane might be pop, top five. Hold on, let me reevaluate. Let me reevaluate. Let me reevaluate that one. Oof, that's a hard reevaluation. That's a hard reevaluation. Kane Kane got to get up in there though. I don't know who I'm gonna pull out. Kane lyrically, man, is yeah tough. yeah yeah yeah. Kane 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 is no nah, Kane is my guy. No, nah, Kane is my guy. Kane, as a matter of fact, Kane's top three. Really? Yeah. And, oh, and you I love you Rakim. Boosted I, him way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about my man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kane, God dang. Kane, <laughs> Kane is up there. I, I was all about Kane. All about Kane. Give me your welcome to the NBA moment. Welcome to the NBA moment. I finally got to start. Jerome Kersey was hurt. Clyde Drexler was hurt. Um, and I got thrown into to the fire. Uh, my rookie year. You didn't know you were starting till you got to the gym? Right. So so I, I'm starting, and we're playing the Washington Bullets. And I'm like, okay, the better Grant is in Chicago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Much love to you, Harvey. Much love to you, man. Man, Harvey Grant, <laughs> Harvey Grant lit my ass up for 33. That's the most I ever had scored on me in the league. Harvey Grant lit my ass up. Hey, Harvey Grant's like, I got me a rookie. And he lit my ass up. Because, you know, I'm like, okay, he can shoot better than his brother. I watch tape. He can shoot better than his brother. But he don't shoot like that. Man, I'd be damned if he didn't light my ass up. What? I got Harvey that fire Grant. started. Harvey what Grant the, lit what, me what up. What did the coach say to you? He, shit, there wasn't nothing to say. He, <laughs> You got to come sit down, bro. You got to come sit down. There's nothing to say. Hey, the horn The horn says it enough. <laughs> and you know, you're walking out like, damn, I got my ass kicked. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that was that was my, you know, everybody would think it might have been Scotty or somebody like that. But Harvey Grant welcomed me to the league. Now, the two hardest dudes I had to guard? Uh-huh. Grant Hill and Tracy McGrady. 20 Ooh. shots with the ball, isos, pick and rolls. Come on, man. Come on. That's a problem to guard. And you're not known as a defender? That's a problem to guard. It's a problem to you know, guard. Can, can you even speak to that a little bit, though? Both of them 6'8". Tracy was a better shooter. Grant was cat quick. Hmm. And he had that thing where he would go through his legs as he's coming forward and yes. cross you over yes. and explode by you. Yes. And then if the big is too late coming over, they in the, they in the post. They in the post. Like Grant, anybody that questions Grant Hill being a Hall of Famer, they need to go, go get some tape. They need to go get some tape. I, I played against Grant Hill, summer leagues and Ooh, everything. Woof. Let me tell you something. There's two Grant Hills, man. Always, you know, a lot of people don't understand. That younger Grant Hill, like that high school Ooh. Grant Hill, he was so smooth. Smooth. Like, glide, man. Like he was like motion with it. Then that college Grant Hill figured out how to be nasty. Ooh. And then that NBA Grant Hill, Figured out how to put them both together. I was like, oh, my yeah. goodness. This dude yeah. nasty ass smooth. Bruh, I played against Grant. The first time I played against Grant was at the Boston shootout. And he was locking up and handling the ball at 6'8 then. I mean, he was a problem then. And he was extremely unselfish. Like, he wasn't aggressive yet. Mm. I played hey. against him in, at Duke. You saw it starting to come along. And I was his teammate with Team USA in 91, the Pan American team. Mm -hmm. So you saw a lot in practice. But that dude in the league, those first couple years with Detroit, my goodness. I got one more story with Grant Hill, man. And then we go, then we go lead that one alone. 
Mm. But we had Nike camp. And so we leave Nike camp and we all get to five star later in the week because, you know, they kind of <laughs> overlapped each other. Right. So right. we get to five star like on Wednesday. About time Friday night came, Grant Hill was the MVP <laughs> of the camp. Like he only played like two games. That's how Yo, dominant that dude was, man. You should have seen him at USA tryouts. Oh, gosh. So you got everybody that's somebody in the gym, minus Shaq, minus Robert Ory and Doug Christie because they got waivers to come to the next next level and Tom Gugliotta. Um, so the rest of us, you got to hoop. You got to make the squad. So you know Jimmy Jackson's going to be out there killing. You know Grant was out there killing. I had the kill to get on the, on, on the squad. Terry DeHair was out there killing. But Walt Williams was serving everybody. So Walt, Walt Williams. Wiz was killing everybody. <laughs> Wiz put on a damn show. Mm. Wiz put on a show. I was like, God dang. 6'8", point guard, high handles, high socks. Man, <laughs> Wiz was put on a show. That shit I saw Wiz do in, in, in the tryouts, I wish there was a camera in there catching all of that. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that you say that because um, we had Tony on the show, man, a while ago, and he was talking yeah. about, man, that Walt might be the greatest player to come up out of Maryland, you know, outside of laying bias. Yeah. I'm telling you, Walt did some shit. Like, he came up to this dude. I forgot who it was. He came up. He's at the free throw lines like a 1-4 flat. He came up. He in and out. He turned around. Wah, wah. And came back around, crossed him, and went to the hole and banged out. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was a show that he was putting on. It was a show. It was a you Damn. can't deny me show. Who was the coach of that team? Ah, uh, what the uh, of the whole team? The, the Olympics. Um, um, it was um Gene Cady. He was the Pan American yeah. coach Gene from Purdue. Katie. Purdue, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, let's let's get Walt into your, put on your the show. Yeah, what what was incredible. Let's get into your your draft. You come out, man, in ninety two. That class is Underrated. ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yep, crazy. I mean <sighs> morning. They don't talk about our they don't talk about our class. Other man. than Shaq and Lonzo, they don't talk about our class. Yeah. Jimmy was number four, Leitner was number three, Walt Williams was in the lottery. Man. Robert Orr was, was number eleven. That, was in there, the Fonzo Fonzo Ellis. was in there. Yeah, yeah. Todd Day, Oliver Clarence Miller. Clarence Weatherspoon. Clarence Weatherspoon. Latrell. Like, it was Doug Christie. Latrell Doug Christie. went Hey, Latrell was the sleeper of the draft. He went behind us. Right. That's what? right. Latrell Spreewell. Man, he was the sleeper of the draft. And then we had some second rounders last 12, 13 years. Matt Geiger, Sean Rooks. Rest in peace to my boy. There, there was second round, Popeye Jones, second rounders that lasted for a long time. Talk, talk a little bit about that draft and particularly your decision to come out early. Well, we forgot about Harold Miner. <laughs> oh, he was in baby, that draft too. Baby Jordan. Baby Jordan. Baby Jordan. So, so this is what we we're doing. Now, Shaq and I were McDonald's All-Americans with Jimmy Jackson. So we all kept in touch. Mm-hmm. Harold was in the, in, in the link, too. And we were just waiting on Shaq. You know, mm. we knew we knew the trickle down was going to be good, right? So when Shaq decided he was going to go, Jimmy said it after that, Harold said it after that, and then I was like, I'm out, too. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I looked at it like this. I, they told me, end of the lottery, mid-first round. That's why I went. Okay. You know, that's why I went. Wow. And, and and you had to, like, get it from reliable sources because you're kind of throwing yourself out there like that. You know what I mean? Mm hmm and, and, and the crazy thing about that, is it, it's like just the whole stress of going to work out for teams and, and then sitting there at the draft. 
I was the last one in the green room. So I was really stressed out. Everybody that said that they were going to take me, that I worked out for, they passed. So I'm now, I'm like, Shh, I didn't work out for nobody from this point forward. So wow. I was, stressed, I was stressed out. I took a walk. Mm. I got up and left the table. So when they called my name at 18 for San Antonio, they had to come get me out the back. Damn. Yeah, I was messed up, bro. Like, and then you initially walk to the to the to the thing to shake David Stern's hand, but it's like I took so long to get out there. They're like, man, forget your hat. Don't mess with the hat. Just hurry up and get to the thing. So I got this hat looking all big on my head, right? Oh man, but but the whole walk, the whole walk, I was like, I'm gonna kill everybody that passed on me. I'm gonna let them have it. I'm, I'm gonna man. Let them have it. Yeah, I'm mad. I'm gonna let them have it. Yeah, it was stressful, man. It was stressful, but you know, it ended up working out. Now, did you did you get an agent right away? Yeah, yeah, you had to. If you were coming out, you had to. And then uh the, the pre draft camp in Chicago, the underclassmen didn't didn't work out. We didn't we didn't play. Mm. You know, so that that you know, I, I could have had my I could have either played myself up or played myself down if I played. Which that's so interesting. Can you even talk a little bit about that now? How you've seen that change now because right um back then if you were a star in college you really and like you said an underclassman you really didn't have to because it was almost saying like if you went and play you might get hurt so yep but kill now, your stock. yeah you kill your stock yeah kill you your stock. mess your stock up yeah but now it's almost like guys got to play yeah they gotta, gotta play. play yeah especially guys like say there was a situation where with the UCLA team a couple years ago, Johnny Juzang wanted to t- test the water. Mm. And he went, and it was a bad showing for him. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, okay, I'm going back to UCLA. But what you did, you already gave him a look at what you are. So mm-hmm. now the draft comes next year, and they're like, ah. You know what I mean? They already know mm. who you are. Mm-hmm. You don't want to let them know who you are too early, especially if you ain't ready. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's got to be strategic on, on how you do everything. Yep. Now now he's in the G League, didn't get drafted when, when didn't get you know, drafted, every, every, right. right. Everybody remembers the year that the final four year where he was killing everybody. <laughs> no doubt. Hey, that right? was killing. Right. People right. like, who, who the fuck is this? This look, where did he Chinese come black looking dude with an right. afro. <laughs> Just killing everybody on the court. Like, what, right, where the fuck is he? Yeah, where he exactly. come from? Where high school he came from? Right. That part. Like, where did he burst on the scene at, right? That's how he should have left then. At. But he did and and had to play. And he right. And Just, right. To Will, to Will's point, say he had to play. Right. He had to wow. play. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. He had to play at the pre draft camp. If it was like when I played, he could have sat out. And just rolled that way. What was that? And then he uh, would have had three years to prove himself after that. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Because <laughs> uh, I Look. remember being at the camp, man, just watching the guys play. Was that that year that Lindsey Hunter also uh, did well at the draft camp? Was that your year? That wasn't. That might have. No, that wasn't my year. It was the year after. That was the year after. It was the year after. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, he is my year. I just left the year Okay, I, I was mm-hmm. I would have been in the '93 draft. Oh, yeah, right. he was '93. Yeah, uh, he okay. he he went down there and killed, from what I understand. <sighs> my goodness, you talking about improving stock? Oh my goodness! But speaking yeah. of stock, what was that draft night drip like? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't much into the style, man. You know, the drip the drip <laughs> is crazy now. The drip is crazy now. I just went and got a got a suit that fitted. You know. I wore a 17 shoe at the time, so it was hard to find shoes. So I found wow. something. And, and so the drip wasn't crazy. You know what I mean? It wasn't crazy. It, it, it got it got better as the years went on. But, you know, I, I wasn't very much in the fashion. I was, I was a big-ass dork, man. You know what I'm saying? It's like I would always be in tennis shoes because I couldn't find those shoes. And then the shoes that they give us, uh, I got the big man shoe. I don't have the cool shit. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I don't have the cool shit. I don't have the shit that y'all got. You know what I mean? I had to <laughs> have the big, big heavy clunker ones. You know what I'm saying? I had the battleships. You walk into that Portland locker room for the first yeah. time and you see that jersey hanging with your name on it, man. How, how you felt? I felt cool. I felt good. But when you look up in there and you know that team just came from the final, I'm looking at I'm looking at Drex, Kersey, Porter, Duckworth. Uh, I'm looking at all of and then the additions, uh, uh Clifford Robinson, Mark Brown. And then I see the additions, mm-hmm. Strickland, Ellie. You know, I'm like, how am I gonna play on this month? <laughs> How am I going to play? Where do I fit? Was you start figuring out, like, what the fuck I got? I'm, what I'm going to have to do in practice to get on the floor to show coach? Like, was that already right. kicking in? It was already kicking in. It, it kicked in when, when I found out after the trades that I was going to Portland. And they said mm. that they can use my talent and all of this. I'm like, wait a minute, time out. Clifford Robinson is shooting it. Shooting it. Terry Porter is shooting it. <laughs> Mary, Mario Ellie can shoot it. Yep. And they said they need my talent. I'm sitting there like, yo, where where am I going to get on the floor? Like, I didn't, I literally didn't get on the floor unless somebody got hurt. I was the break of in case of emergency. And and back then there was no G League. Right. So you and, and and when you got an older team, we don't practice. That's right. So I got out of shape. Uh, uh, mm. mentally, mentally, I was I was fucked up because I wasn't getting no reps. Wasn't getting and no reps. Like, you wasn't right, playing. you can only play so much two on two, three on three. You can run so many lines in in seventeens. It's like you. It's like that. You need in game reps, or else you're just gonna fall by the wayside. There was no. There was no. No. No skill development coaches back then. Wow. It was just a head coach. And three assistants. That's, That's it. it. Head coach wasn't really fooling with you. The assistants, you know, you had to beg them to come out of the locker room. You know, uh, you know, when I got to Washington and Bernie Bickerstaff was our coach, Mike Brown was a workhorse. Now, Mike would come and try to get you to pull you out of the locker room. You know what I mean? Thank goodness for Mike Brown, you know, but but see during that time I was in the rotation already. So it's like yeah. it's like, all right, Mike, I need a little bit of rest, man. <laughs> I, I, what I what need year it. were you in Washington? I was in Washington my fourth year through my eighth year. What what year? So right you? no, no, fifth year through through ninth year. Fifth through ninth. So that was after the 95 championship, after the first year, the inaugural year, the Toronto Raptors, 95, 96. So it was 96, 97 was my first year. We had the Bulls in the first round, and they were Ooh. talking about we were the team of the future. That's right. When Mike, that's and, right. Mike had 55 in game so two. that's with you, and they swept Weber, us. Howard. Yeah. Howard, Strickland, Chaney, yep. Legler, Ooh. Mirasan, you know. Chris yeah. Whitney. Chris Whitney, Liddell Echols. Yeah, we had we Harvey Grant. You know, we had a squad. We had a nice Ashraf Amaya, Ben, a young Ben Wallace. A young yes. Ben Wallace. So, yeah, man, a young Ben Wallace, man. I mean, we we had we had talent. I gotta ask you this. You talked about how Harvey gave it to you. Did y'all ever have that conversation? No, we didn't have that conversation, but 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 Harvey ended up playing a power as he got older. So we never had to guard each other anymore. You know, I had to, I had to guard Juwan. You know, that was our practice thing. Me and Juwan was going at it. So, but, you know, we, we, we played hard against each other and we made each other better. Hey, Trace, I also want to say this, man, because, I mean, you just said it, but we kind of glanced over it. But uh, I'm glad me and Will do this. We teamed up to do this show because, you know, how they talk about mental health issues and stuff like yeah. that. The things that you just went through, going through with your basketball career, you know, like you said, you're on an older team, all you know, all the, all that mental stuff that you was dealing with, 
people would want to know how did you get through that? You didn't turn, you know, you didn't turn in no alcohol, no drugs, you didn't, but you knew the signs where you was like, this shit is getting away from me. I'm not working out. I'm not playing. Right. That, that is, that is so vital now because I mean, you had to be so strong mentally, you know, to get, you know, worth, I don't know if some vets pulled you aside and said, Hey man, just keep your head. You know, how did, how, how was, just give us three quick things of how you was able to maintain and not, and not lose it. Both me and Cam went through a lot of mental health stuff. You know, my pops had to move to Louisville, uh, for the, for like three or four months to make sure my brother finished school because of the, the stuff he was going through at Louisville. Um, and, and, and Washington DC is, is not a long flight. So I was going through some shit there. Pops would jump on the flight and come there and check me out and, and for a couple of days and make sure I was cool. My pops had a lot of air miles, bro. A lot of air miles because between coming up to Portland, coming to Houston, being part of the championship parade, but I wasn't playing, you know, mm-hmm. like all of this stuff, man, y'all's career, my career, everything chasing, everything's a mental health. Man, everything's mental health. Yeah. This thing ain't new. This thing ain't new. Everybody think it's just a new thing right now. It's not new. It's not new. We were told we come from the suck it up generation. Y'all suck that shit up. Tell them. Y'all suck that shit up, man. Pick yourself up off the ground, dust yourself off, and let's go. That That's what it was. You know, and now everybody uses it as an excuse not to do well or use it as an excuse to, to fail. Don't use it as an excuse to fail. Use it as motivation. Use it as I'm going to show this coach I can play, even though he ain't he ain't cool with, with, with what I'm bringing to the table. And if it doesn't work, get your agent on his job to get you out of there to a better situation. Like because once you get in the league, it's 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 this is where I went wrong at. It's not basketball, fellas. It's a business. It's a business. It don't matter how many asses you bust in practice. And Gilbert Arenas talked about this on his podcast, about how many people's asses he busted and it didn't matter. They got they got the salaries, bro. It's like they're not going to – if I'm making 1.1, the guy in front of me is making 3.5. I'm not playing. How are you going to justify that to your, your owner who's paying the salary that – Okay, I'm paying a one point. I'm playing a one point five guy over a three point five guy. It doesn't make sense. And he getting more minutes, right? Because they got in their mind who puts asses in seats and sells jerseys. They got in their own mind who, who does that. But how does a coach find themselves responsible for that? Because if the if the ownership and the management is picking the guys and paying them that money, they're on that street. Mm. They're, they're puppets too. There are some that cut the strings. Pat Riley, Phil Jackson, they cut the strings and do their own thing. You know, they don't care. They don't care. You know, they, they cut the strings and do their own thing. Hey, Trey's Will, this is what I told a kid the other day. I was just talking to him about professionalism, like yeah. what, what is being a professional. I was, mm-hmm. like, I was like, let me break it down for you in, just in this category. I'm going to use basketball, the NBA. I say, you the eleventh man on the on, on the team, mm-hmm. and y'all and y'all on a five game road trip, and yep. you ain't played in no game. You ain't he ain't put you in none, mm-hmm. but y'all playing at home the sixth game, and he puts you in. Mm-hmm. He expects for you to come be professional. No pouting. That was me. I was eleven, twelfth man, tenth, eleven, twelfth man. Those my first three, four years, three years in the league, Portland and Houston, I didn't play. So I got out of shape, which is unprofessional. I had a negative attitude, which was unprofessional. You know, you always when you light when you start lighting motherfuckers up, you're gonna you're gonna let people know that you're doing. Got me sitting on the bench over here. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna let people know you're doing it. Pouting, moping, not into the game, not supporting your teammates. I did all of that shit. So, and 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 th- and this is where it all comes from. I was a starter my whole life. I kicked everybody's ass my whole life and was a starter. Mm-hmm. Okay, 
I came off the bench a little bit at the beginning of my UCLA career. Started the rest of the whole time. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe one month of not starting in my whole career. And now, not only am I not starting, I'm not playing. Period. Unless somebody get hurt. So, I didn't take that too. And and who would? Who would? You've been doing something your whole life and you've been good at it. Right. And you get here? Mm-hmm. Well, here's another thing. That's why they say it's a man's game. I was a kid <sighs> in a man's game. I was 20 years old, turned 21, playing against grown men, and I was acting like a child. So, and, and, and not only did I do that, but that reputation follows you throughout the rest of your career now. Every general manager knows that this is a problem. Now, when you get to the end and you want to kick it and be a mentor, they're like, oh, hell no, you you want to play. Not knowing that you have matured from 20 years old up until 32, I've matured. Right. I don't care about playing anymore. Let me help these young. Nah, get the fuck out. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's like, they remember when you were negative, right? Not They don't care if you were a kid or not. Mm-hmm. They remember the negativity, that stigma follows you, and then when, it's, when your skills diminish and you get a little bit older, they can't wait to kick you out. Really? And nail the door shut. Hey, and you know what? That, that That's what I told the kid. I said, I said, a coach expect for you to be professional even when yes. he played you five games. Right. But his thing is, when I call your number, be ready. Be ready. You supposed to be professional and be ready and go into the game and do what you do. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm like, and yeah. if you don't do that, you're not growing. You're not understanding what you're involved in and what you're trying to perceive because shit. I mean, just think about it, Will. We we all would act that way because we're human. We used right. to playing and we're stars where we was. Now we yep. get to the NBA and it ain't no NBA handbook and tell you that you're supposed nah. to be professional. It ain't that nah. shit wasn't around. I mean, even if a vet and vets kind of can can sniff out rookies who kind of going through, you know, a tough time in the league, they'll put them up under their wing. Who was those vets for you? Clyde Drexler did okay. that to me. Uh, Clyde Drexler and Mario Ellis. You know, I, I I didn't... Clyde, at the time, I believed him because he didn't have to take his time out because he was the man on the team. He didn't have to take his time out to come talk to me. You know, he didn't have yeah. to. Mario Ellis gave me a lot of jewels. And I tell him to this day, Mario, thanks, bro. Because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have lasted 12 mm. years. Because... He was telling me, look, this is what you got to do to last in the league. And I'm like, you the competition telling me this, so I'm not trusting you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But what he was telling me was the right thing. You know, be, be a star in your role and what your role is. Be a star in your role. You don't have to be the star but be a star in your role. Mario was a star in his role, bro. But I get what you're saying with that, but it's so it's so difficult, like you said earlier, when you a young guy mm-hmm. and you're going through that. I think I think sometimes what was was missed from the athlete is that like where's that fine line or that thin line? Like when you weren't playing, coaches would say, you should be angry. You should be mad. You right, should right. be fighting. But then you mad, you angry, you fighting, you pouting, it's looked that negative. Like what's right. what what's that middle ground that decide that it's 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 pouting and you being, you know, disrespectful to the team versus it being like, man, this kid just wants to play. What's what's that line? Well, the coaches in the league are non confrontational. They don't want to talk to you, especially if you're negative. They're, they're, they're not, they don't want that conflict. But your teammates, when it gets bad, your teammates will pull you to the side and be like, yo, it's, it's, it's starting to mess with us now. You're starting to rub us the wrong way. You're starting to disrespect us now. 
Gotcha. Mm. You know, like, for example, I turned my ankle at the end of the season in Houston. Houston decided to put me on the inactive list for the whole playoff. There was also some political stuff behind it because they, there was some, a guy that they had to keep on the on the roster that was from overseas. So, I now we've all been hurt with a situation where emotionally we're just fucked up, right? Yeah. After after that. So I'm fucked up the whole ride down to Galveston from Houston because we had like a little mini camp down there before the playoffs started. Mm. As soon as I get there, Clyde and, 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 and Dream pull me to the side immediately. They both pull me to the side. Now, two dudes, as I say again, did not have to talk to me at all, right? You got two Hall of Famers. So they they pull me into in, in the restaurant like right in the little little booth, and they're like, "Look, you were dealt a fucked up situation. You can't control your situation. Don't worry about things you can't control. But what you we, we're trying to do something special. We're trying to reap. So this is how you can help us. Be positive. Cheer your team on. In practice." Be who, whoever you're supposed to be in practice. Be better than that guy. Damn. Prepare us to win. So that's what I did, and then what? I ended up getting a full share of other playoff money. You know, of course you get your ring, but I get my full share too because I wasn't an asshole. I I, I respected them enough to believe what they were saying. And, and have faith and trust in them, and they went and got the job done. Wow. And you did your part, showing up part. in practice, cheering people on, being encouraging. Man, if people were to say I didn't earn my ring, they, they got the middle finger because I earned mine. You know what I'm saying? In practice, I was, you know, I was doing my thing. You know, I was going hard. That had to be some powerful shit for two Hall of Famers to pull you to, to side when at a restaurant. I know you would be like, "What the fuck did I do? I hope I ain't did nothing to this." Well, they knew, no, they knew, but they knew I was messed up, and they knew that I wasn't a bad dude. You know what I mean? And they knew I was. They knew mentally I was. I could have went off the deep end, man. That's another mental health thing, and you know what I'm saying? That had to be special too, because your rookie year, you with Clyde. And then yep. on the back end of class career, you team up with him again. I mean, that ha- Hey, he, he, he took me with him in this trade. I mean, I, I think he had something to do. Like, by the time Clyde was traded, things in Portland was damaged. Like, P.J. Carlissimo was the new coach. Clyde and P.J. kept getting into it. P.J. said some things to me that was disrespectful. We got into it. So he mm. didn't want us there. He didn't want us there. And, you know, I love PJ to this day. PJ's a good dude. You know, he's just competitive in between the lines. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So so me and him, are re- we're good to this day. But we, so we were in the trade together going to Houston. And, and you know, to go there and, and watch him and Dream get back together, to re- rekindle the old five slammer jammer thing. And Clyde played like a 20-year-old, man. He played like yeah, a 20-year-old. He was... It, it, it's a difference between playing when you're when you're not happy and then playing when you're happy. Ninety five, Toronto, you averaging sixteen point two. Tell me about that. Tell me about that, Tracy Murray. What what what? How you feeling about this time now? Like, I'm a vet now. Like, I'm just gonna let it fucking fly. Well, well, what happened was at the beginning of that season, nobody was knocking down. I was a free agent. Nobody was knocking my door down. The so Houston had protected me in the expansion draft. Then all of a sudden they decide to change, you know, just do a 180 and say, okay, we're, we're not interested anymore after the, the, the expansion draft was over. So yeah. I'm stuck. They're not going to re-sign me, and they already got their rosters. And they're in training camp already, and I'm sitting at home working my ass off, right, in the best shape of my life, Hungry as hell, just chomping at the bit to get get my my you know opportunity. 
Y'all's big brother saved my career. And he's my big brother to this day. He's my big brother to this day. Zeke saved my career, bro. Zeke saved my career. Are you serious? I, I thank him every day for it. I call him every I call him every so often and keep thanking him for it. Because he was honest with my agent. My age, agents are dirty sometimes, dog. They, you know, they want their money, right? So, so my agent kept trying to get money. He told my agent, look, because of the rules the way they are, we only have minimum. So I, I'm like, look, I told my agent, look, stop bullshitting. Give me his number. Let me talk to him. Because we had prior, we had prior communication when he was in Detroit. He was like, when I was in Portland, he was like, man, you know, you happy over there? I'm like, nah, come get me. <laughs> you know, so, and that's when Alan Houston was on the team. I went in that locker room to, to hang out with Al for a second. Mm-hmm. So, so here it is, fast forward. I, I'm talking to him on the phone. He's like, T, we ain't got no money, bro. So if, if, if that's what you're looking for, then I, I can't really help. He was 1,000 with me. He said, but I, what I do have, an opportunity for you to re, restart your career, you got minutes and shots up here. I said, look, send me a plane ticket. Send me a plane ticket. I'm coming. So this was on a Thursday. I get up there. Our first game is on a Saturday. So I, I played, I played like about the first 35, 40 games coming off the bench behind Willie Anderson. Then when they made that trade, I, I was hooping. I started hooping off the bench. They made that trade and traded Willie Anderson. Then they put me in the starting lineup. And then I averaged 22 as a starter and 16 altogether. So I finally got my chance to go out and do it. I, you know, had num- num- numerous 30-point games. I had a 40-point fo- game. You was a fan favorite shooting behind that arc in Toronto. I remember that hey, shit. Man, it, it, it set me up for the rest of my life, and, and Zeke is responsible for that. Now, what, what year was that? That was 95, 96, right after the championship. Fun fact. Fun fact. So that mm-hmm. team, right? Yep. So Zeke calls me up and I, and invites me to camp. But I twisted my knee so I could not go. Fun oh. fact. We could have been teammates. Who knows, right? Damn. Could have been teammates. Did you picture both of us shooting that thing? Hey, man, listen. I'd have just been happy to put that uniform on. I'd, listen, I'd have been that <laughs> shit leader. You didn't have to worry about it. I'd have been that guy. Keep shooting that thing, Tracy. Hey, Keep hey. shooting it. <laughs> But I know you. Yeah. You I, come from the same school. Yeah, yeah, that dog with the cane. Same era. Yeah. That, you got dog in you. You're not yeah. going to be, that dog want to bite. Yeah, that dog That dog with ain't going to sit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But you know yeah. what? You would you would, you would have worked. You know what I'm saying? You, you would have worked. Absolutely. You know, and, and everybody's 100 with each other. You know, everybody's 100 with themselves. Like, there were situations where there was a, a dude that came in training camp and killed everybody, right, in, when I was in Washington. Mm-hmm. I'm like, woo wee. I'm glad I got my seven year deal. My ass might have been cut. <laughs> you always have a dude that come through camp that run through all the stars, run through all the stars. I've seen it happen time and time again. Hey Trace, it, 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 I mean the, the vet dudes would be like, man, it's okay. That motherfucker just helping me get into shape. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, no, the vet dudes when he start cooking, the vets gonna get on the bikes. <laughs> <laughs> on the bikes, they get on the bikes. That's right. They gonna get on the bikes. I'm out. I'm out this day. Let me go get on the bike. That's right. <laughs> yeah, they didn't want this. They like I'm cool. Yeah, they, yeah you can go ahead and say it. they didn't want that smoke. <laughs> no, nah, they didn't want the smoke, man. I mean, cause you know you got you got your 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 thing about you. You know your confidence about you, your swag about you. You know what I'm saying that you built up over years, and then you got this young whippersnapper coming in. He's more athletic because, you know, you done got worn down a little bit. You you know, you don't want to get cut up by a young dude, you know. That's right. That's but, it, right. but it happens to the best of us. That's how we get replaced. And unfortunately, that's the that's the game. Yep. Let me ask you this about the one, one team. Was Vernon Maxwell crazy? Mad Max is my man. You know what? He a good dude, man. He a good dude, but you don't want to be on his bad side. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to be on this bad side. Max is a good dude. Charles Oakley was my teammate. He's a great dude. These guys are total team guys, man. You just don't want to be on their bad side. 
You, you know, know why I liked it? I liked the Gary Payton, Vernon Maxwell, and Xavier McDaniel because they all talk shit to Michael Jordan. Like, they didn't yeah. care. No. Like, they was like, no, nah, motherfucker, you ain't just gonna just do me like in any type of right. way, motherfucker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back at your ass because Mad Max used to, used to give Michael Jordan some shit, too. Fits. He used to give him fits. Yep. That's why we believe that we would have beat those two teams if Mike was still there. Those, those two years, we still would have been champions. Vernon still say that to this day. He believed that shit. Yeah, yeah. We we were loaded, man. We were loaded too. They would have they would have had to deal with a monster that they weren't used to dealing with with the king. You know, it's interesting, man. That would have been like that's literally probably the greatest championship that never happened. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That that was in Chicago. Been, that was it. Yeah, that would have been that was yeah. it. Especially that 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 second year. That was so improbable. But listen, we have, um, man, Tracy, we know we got to go. So um, real quickly, AJ just got one more question for you. Go ahead. What's the next chapter in Tracy Murray's hoop dream? Tracy Murray's hoop dream is going to, to Malia Murray right now. My daughter is 10 years old. I'm just trying to pour into her what I know. My, my son didn't want to play. He's in the Army. But... My my ten year old, she loves the game. She's you know she's trying to be uh, the best version of her. Um, my wife is six one. I'm six seven, so she's gonna be tall. Yes. Uh, my youngest one, my youngest one, Tiana, is just starting to play too. So I'm pouring into my girls right now, and and also uh, Cam's daughter is a killer. You know, Kayla, Kayla's a killer. Yeah, and and, and, and Cam Junior starting to come along too. So. We're just pouring in. We're just pouring into our kids now, man. We we've done it. We poured into everybody else's kids with Prodigy. Now we're just trying to make sure we don't fail our own kids. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. Know I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all for going there again. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Hoop Dreams the Podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Written and produced by Arthur AG, Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, with audio engineering from Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah.